Hey, praise God for everything he's doing over at Avon. Avon, we love you. We're so proud of you. Fishers, we're amazed at what God's doing there. And I want to shout out as well to our 745 classic service. We love you guys too. We're in this series called Satisfied. We're studying the book of Ecclesiastes. And it has this theme of satisfaction and joy. And tonight we're going to get into the joy part of it. If you were here last week, we were in kind of the bad news part of it. Now we're going to start to really get into the good news that God gives us right here in this life. Uh, Speaking of good news, on Easter, uh, 318 people gave their lives to Christ and received the gift of eternal life. I want to tell you just three. Yeah, we can celebrate that. And I want to just tell you... Uh, Three stories out of those 318, very briefly, okay? One uh, was a veteran who was actually contemplating taking his life the night before he came to Easter. One of you invited him. He came. He heard from God. He gave his life to God. He prayed with one of our pastors. He's getting all the help that he needs, and his wife is now on board with him, and his life is transforming. Another story was a gal in her 20s who came by herself, heard the good news in a way she'd not heard it before, came forward, gave her life to Christ. I heard a story of a family that was actually on their way to a different church, and because of traffic, they decided to pull in here. And uh, maybe that's the good thing about all the traffic we cause, but anyhow, this is a great story because a realtor in our church happened upon this family just by doing realtor work, and they were like, somehow came about this story. Well, they had a teenager with them, and he received the good news, raised his hand in prayer. His parents were so excited. They've been coming ever since. So those are three stories out of 318. Next week, we'll get to see some of those people be baptized. If you haven't yet been baptized, you've got to be here to see what it's like. And next week, by the way, is a great week to invite anyone who's not yet a believer, or maybe it doesn't seem like they're living out their faith, or they just need some hope, because we will be declaring in a really powerful way the good news of Jesus. All right, satisfaction, what does it look like? Joy, what does it look like? I don't think it could look much more than this. Take a look and feel free to laugh along. Yeah, puppies and kids, it doesn't get much better than that. And uh, do you realize this? God wants you to enjoy your life. This is one of the themes in the book of Ecclesiastes. And depending on how you were raised, your view of God, uh, the way I was raised, God is holy. He's all powerful. We should revere him. All that is true. But there was nothing like this, that God, he actually wants you to enjoy your life. This is a theme in this book of Ecclesiastes. Just as much as you want the people you love to enjoy their life. If you have a son or a daughter, a nephew or a niece, you don't want them to grow up and be miserable. You want them to love their life. Did you know that God feels this way about you? In fact, just think of these moments. If you're a pet lover, dog people, cat people, we're a church with room for both. Think of this moment when when you just are like rubbing the belly of your pet and they're so happy and it makes you happy. Or if you're a parent, think of those moments where you're with your kid and you're making a memory. I mean, why do we buy treats for our dogs? It's a multi-billion dollar industry or cats. Why do parents and grandparents spend thousands of dollars for a few days at Disney or at Universal for some smiles and some memories? It's because we delight to see the people we love delighted. 
And did you know that God is the same way? In fact, that part of you that loves to see your dog's tail wagging or your kid's face smiling, that is the image of God in you. God is the author of joy. I think most of us are pretty good at wanting the people we love to enjoy life. But I don't think many of us grasp that our Father, our Creator, actually feels the same way about us. He actually wants you to love your life. He wants you to enjoy your life. If God delights to see us delighted, (laughs) what can we do to start experiencing this? Because I don't know about you, but that's not my experience every day of my life. Or let's get real, let's be honest, if God wants us to be satisfied, to enjoy life, then why is life full of pain? Why is your life and mine full of disappointment, of heartbreak, of fatigue? Why did many of us walk in here tonight? There's just situations where we feel stuck, we feel discouraged, we're lonely. Moments of hurt become seasons of hurt, and we're anything but satisfied. This book of Ecclesiastes, it's part of the Old Testament, which means it was written before Jesus came to earth. Now, it's still God's word. It's still fully true. But it describes life without eternal life. It describes our life right here, right now. And in some ways, the book of Ecclesiastes is uncomfortable, some of the things that it says, but it's full of this deep, profound wisdom. Last week, we looked at this verse from chapter 7. It says, you're better off going to funerals than going to parties. Why? Well, because when you go to a funeral, it makes you realize I have a certain number of decades maximum that I'll have on earth. I should think about where I go after and I should think about what I do with those time, uh, with the time I have. It's bad news that leads to the good news. The book of Ecclesiastes we learned last week from our guest speaker, Richard, has two themes in it, under the sun... And what that means is this is a book of the Bible that is, it's not so much about heaven and eternal life. There's a lot of books of the Bible that cover that. But this book of the Bible, almost in contrast, it's about right here, right now. It's about the job you have right now. It's about the family you have. It's about your health, your pleasure, your fulfillment. And within that, it's about how do you find joy within a very broken world, This other theme that we saw or phrase is the Hebrew word havel, which means vaporous. Richard illustrated by lighting a match that uh, it's like smoke. It's like trying to grab smoke. The word can also be translated perfume. If you try to grab it, it actually moves away faster. So don't wear yourself out trying to capture your moments of joy in a bottle. That's impossible. But hey, when it blows your way, enjoy it. Don't waste the good times longing for the bad times, and certainly don't waste the good times worrying about how they could get worse. Like when it's good, enjoy it. It's almost like an apple. You know, we hear the story of Adam and Eve, and we often hear that it was an apple. The Bible doesn't say it. It says it was a fruit, okay? So give apples a shot, all right? But I want you to think of your life as an apple. You know, in the Garden of Eden, there were hundreds of fruits, and there was just one That God said, I don't want you to eat that one because it will give you the knowledge of evil. And then you'll experience death and pain. So don't eat that one. But you have a free will, so it's your choice. These other hundreds are yours. I think because of that story, we tend to have this idea, God doesn't want us to bite into life. He doesn't want the juice dripping down the front of our face. He doesn't want us to enjoy life. But really, if you read Ecclesiastes over and over, as I've been doing the last few weeks, there's this theme of God absolutely wants you to enjoy your life. Take the biggest bite that you can here and now, even though as a believer, you're living for the hereafter and for something more. In my experience with Christians, you get two extremes. You get Christians who believe a false teaching called health and wealth, which says if you have enough faith, you'll never have problems, you'll never get sick. That's not true. They're very good at living, enjoying the here and now. Understanding that he's a God of blessing and prosperity. There's some truth in that. They take it a little too far. Then there's other Christians, the kind I grew up with, God's frozen people. So heavenly minded, they're of no earthly good. 
And they are absolutely living for the next kingdom. And hey, if there's a smile on your face, you're probably not sacrificing for Jesus as much as you should be. (laughs) And what's beautiful about the whole of Scripture, there's 66 books in here, is that, yes, we are to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. We're to live for heaven. That should be our number one priority. And yet, in the same verse, Jesus says, as you seek first the kingdom of God... All the things you need on earth will be added to you. It is possible. Part of a mature life, a well-rounded Christian life, is that like Jesus, like Paul the Apostle, you're living for heaven, you're living for the Father, you're dying to yourself. But as you connect with the Father, He gives you the ability to enjoy the life that you have on earth. And that's the question that we're going to ask in our time. How do you extract joy out of your life? If if life is like an apple, how do you bite into it? I'm convinced that most of us, most days, there's a conveyor belt and an apple goes by and we don't pick it up and we don't take a bite out of it. What are your spiritual teeth? What are your spiritual taste buds? How do you do this? How do you extract the joy from life? What if you could leave this message today more able to savor the good moments in your life? And what if you could leave here today more durable and more hopeful even in the difficult moments of your life? You've heard this Christian cliche that happiness and joy are different. Let me explain why. Happy, the root word hap, is the same word, root word, that you get in the word haphazard or happenstance or happening. So happiness is not something you can choose. Happiness is something that happens to happen to you. And when it it comes your way, enjoy it. But it's totally different than joy. Nehemiah 8 verse 10 says the joy of the Lord is our strength. The book of Ecclesiastes over and over says enjoy life. En meaning bring joy into your life. This Hebrew word joy can be translated literally, the absence of fear. Isn't that interesting? There's a lot of moments that you've had this week where you could have had joy, but fear blocked you from enjoying the moment, didn't it? Fear of what could go wrong. Fear of what didn't work out in the past. What if you could live this next week completely free from fear? Can you position your thinking, your life, So that you're ready to catch the pass of happiness when it comes your way, but also so that you're 200% free from fear or worry in the difficult times. These are the things that we're going to learn to do as we study the book of Ecclesiastes now and all the way up to Memorial Day. I don't know if any of you ever saw the Avengers movies. There's a main character in there named Iron Man, and his kind of human character, sort of like the Bruce Wayne of Batman. The guy's name is Tony Stark. Tony Stark is a billionaire. He inherited this huge company from his dad. He's got every toy you could want. He's surrounded by beauty and pleasure. I love the expression on his face here in this picture of him at a casino. That's like classic Tony Stark. I say that because the author of Ecclesiastes, in modern terms, the closest thing is really like a Tony Stark. Solomon, who wrote Ecclesiastes, he's a well-documented historic figure. He was a billionaire inheritor, multi-billionaire. Not only that, God blessed him and one day said, Solomon, I'll give you anything. What do you want? Solomon asked for wisdom And God gave him that. And so he's one of those inheritors who then very wisely, in very smart ways, multiplied his fortune. Became the wealthiest king ever in the history of Israel as he multiplied his dad's fortune. Now, in the U.S. and in the West, we have an idea of wealth. We measure it by dollars. But if you travel to the Middle East today and you go to Saudi Arabia... There's a different level of wealth. Here's a Saudi prince. What I mean by a different level of wealth is not just the measurement in dollars. What I mean is these guys can do whatever they want. There's no Supreme Court. There's no voters. (laughs) There's no accountability. And so while Elon Musk might have more money than this guy, this guy has a lot more freedom than Elon Musk or Mark Zuckerberg or anyone else. 
And the wealth over there now in, in cities like Dubai, it's immense. And the reason I say that is Solomon, he could go out. Imagine your life. If you could go out any day, you can do whatever you want. You can buy whatever you want. You can summon whoever you want. Nothing is off limits of any of your desires. What would life be like? And this is what life was like for Solomon, the author of this book of the Bible. He had extreme wealth. He had the ability to do just whatever he wanted, probably beyond in unbridled ways what we could imagine. And at the end of his life, he pretty much says, hey, I used my life as a laboratory. Most of you aren't going to have the opportunity to do some of the things I do. But can I tell you what I learned? That's the gist of Ecclesiastes. He journaled about his life, and in 12 fairly short chapters, he says, here's what life is all about. Don't waste your time going after some of these things. Do invest your time going after these other things. And a good summary of it is chapter 2, verse 24, when he says, a person can do nothing better than what? Eat and drink, find satisfaction in your work, in taking care of your home, taking care of your family, in your career and calling, this, he says, is from the hand of God. Now, maybe you've heard the old Epicurean saying, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. When you first read Ecclesiastes, you might think, is, is that what this is saying? Is this just saying, you know, gorge yourself, get drunk, because tomorrow we die? Not quite. Now, it is saying enjoy yourself, but, it, but notice that highlighted phrase, your life, everything in your life is from the hand of God. That's different than eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die. Enjoy, savor your work, your meals, your family. Enjoy it as a gift from God. What Solomon found, what God is teaching us is that when you see the hand of God in the good moments of your life, you recognize God's hand in every good moment, that is the key to unlocking joy in your life. So this week for me, as I've been applying this, I've had moments where instead of just rushing through my cup of coffee, I'm slowing down and I'm like, wow, God, this smells so good. Now, I'm not just doing like a Buddhist or Zen thing of like just being in the now. I'm not just being grateful. There's power in some of that stuff or good, that, those are good things, okay? But what I'm saying is, God, this coffee smells so good. My life would be miserable without coffee. I receive this as a gift from you. I receive my coffee as a gift from you. All these green plants and all the flowers that are blooming, I just want to receive that as a gift from you. This is the discipline. It can become a life skill. And what then as you start to do that, you can start to say, you know what, God? I don't really have peace today, but you've promised me as a follower of Jesus peace that surpasses understanding. So I'm going to receive that from you today just as much as I received my cup of coffee. Here's our big idea. Recognizing God's hand in every good moment of your life. This is the key to tasting more joy here and now. I know some of you are so spiritual, you're like, well, life's not about the here and now. I agree, here and now matters less than where we're going, but it's a both and. There is untapped joy in most of our lives because we haven't developed the habit of recognizing the hand of God anytime there's a good moment. Thank you, God, for this dog that greets me at the door. Thank you for kids who are healthy. Thank you that I get to have bedtime and I get to pray and play imaginary games with this little one who 10 years from now will probably be getting married to some guy who doesn't deserve her. Thank you for this moment. Thank you for the good in my life. In chapters 5 and 6 of Ecclesiastes, Solomon is going to give us a contrast uh, there are no pictures in the Bible, sadly, so I've brought some of my own, okay? These two guys represent two characters. Solomon's going to make a contrast. A guy on the left, he, ha he has his, his needs are provided for. He has what Solomon calls wealth and prosperity. The idea would be a middle-class American life. He, ha he has a home. His needs are met. He's not going hungry. 
uh, he has enough. He doesn't have way more than enough, but he has enough. In chapter 6, Solomon's going to contrast him with another guy who has dozens of homes. But it's actually the first guy who has more joy in his life. It's irony. And Solomon's definitely writing from experience as the one who had, you know, dozens of homes. And I want to walk you into this contrast. It starts in 5 verse 18. This is what I've observed to be good. It's appropriate for a person, that's the guy on the left, our middle class guy, to eat, to drink, find satisfaction in his toilsome labor under the sun during the few days of life God has given him. Because this, this is our lot. I mean, this is life as humans. Our bodies will die. What's good is that Hebrew word that God used in Genesis when he created the earth. And he said it's good, the word tov. What's fitting is to be enjoyed without fear. He, this guy is a guy who he goes to his work and, you know, he whistles while he works, as they used to say. He's listening to stuff. He's talking to people. He just enjoys what he does. And he gets home. And he has a great meal with his kids. And there's laughter and there's smiles. And when he closes the house up at night, he stands in the driveway and he looks at the house. And it's not that big of a house, but he's like, you know what? I worked for this house and it's just right for my family. It's just right for us. The key to Bible study is always reading the next verse. Verse 19 when God gives this guy wealth and possessions, notice this, and the ability to enjoy them. Now, here is where we part with American TV commercial thinking. God's thinking is this. It's one thing to have possessions. It's another thing to be able to enjoy them. See how it gets a little deep? And deep is good. Because our society just says, get more, 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 whether it's possessions, relationships, followers, attention, accolades, whatever your thing is, we all have our thing. If you get more, you'll be happy. God says, and Solomon says, is the wisest man who ever lived, actually, you could learn to have more joy with what you have than wearing yourself out going for more. I mean, don't tell the TV commercial people that. To accept their lot. In other words, you know what? Uh, I've accepted I'll never play in the NBA. But how bad would my life be if every morning I woke up and was like, man, I'm just so disappointed I'll never play in the NBA. Right? I'd be obsessing on something that I could have a great life and just ignore the fact that I'll never play in the NBA or I could obsess on it and make myself depressed. Seems like a silly example because you look at me and it's obvious. But we do the same thing. We always need the next thing, want the next thing, when actually there's a big juicy apple right in front of us and we're looking right past it. Be happy in their toil. This is a gift from God. Verse 20, this guy, this middle-class guy we saw on the left, he seldom reflects on the days of his life. In other words, it's not as he's getting older, he's like, oh man, when I was young, you know, now we all have moments like that. But this guy's not living in the past. Like, oh man, back when I, you should have seen me back when. Have you ever met someone like that? They can't even live in the present because they're so defined by the past. He's also not so obsessed with the future that he's missing the present. God keeps him occupied with gladness of heart. Notice this, every gift has two parts. There's the ability to receive it, then there's the ability to enjoy it. Now, if you're here and you haven't yet received the free gift of salvation, that's the most important gift you can receive. It's what we talked about at Easter. It's that God loves you so much. He came into our world in the person of Jesus. He died on the cross in your place. He rose from the dead. If you will be humble enough to admit that you need his help, Ask him to forgive your sins. Tell him you want him to be the Lord and Savior of your life. He will forgive your sins, past, present, future. He'll adopt you into the family of God. And just like he rose from the dead, you will have eternal life. So that's the most important gift that you can receive. But every gift has these two parts. And I'm convinced from my own life that there are a lot of Christians who've received salvation, but they've not really learned to enjoy it. It hasn't really changed their joy level here and now. Now, I'm going to just be honest about my story, my life. I'm bad at both halves of these two parts of a gift. 
I'm bad at receiving gifts, and I'm really bad at enjoying gifts. Uh, one example, this will sound silly to some of you, but the way I grew up, I was the youngest of four boys, so everything was a, a hand-me-down, hand-me-down, hand-me-down. And just the way my family was, I mean, we were happy, so don't mishear me on this, but our, our shopping for clothes was garage sales and Goodwill and Salvation Army. That was just the way we lived. I, the thought of going to a store and buying something new as far as clothes never occurred to me. Even all the way through college, it wasn't until my 20s that I realized, oh, there's people who go to stores and buy the clothes new. I didn't know that. And so to this day, when I get something new, like a white shirt like this, which had hung in my closet for two years before I wore it for this message, I'll get something new and it'll sit in my closet because I'll look at it and I'll think, man, that thing is so clean and nice. I better not wear it or I'll mess it up. <laughs> I'm broken like that. I'm broken like that. And so I, I, it's one thing to receive the gift and it's sitting in your closet. It's another to put it on and be like, hey, who cares if I get a stain on it? Who cares if there's, you know, there's more to come. And I'm convinced there's a lot of shirts hanging in our closets as American Christians. Or you meet the person who's got the really nice car. I, I see this a lot at car meets. I've got a fun car that I enjoy, but it's got some dings. It's what we call a driver. But there's some cars where there's not a single ding. There's no chip in the paint. And what I've noticed, they're great to look at, but the owners tend to not enjoy them quite as much as having a driver. So, you know, hey, get one of each, right? Because we're supposed to enjoy life, all right? There's the gift, and then there's the capacity to extract the enjoyment out of the gift. Uh, I want you to think of your favorite meal. This may or may not be it. This is an example. Imagine your favorite meal. Now, I want you to imagine that I take you to your favorite restaurant, whatever it is. Well, what's your favorite restaurant? Just in your own mind answer. I take you there. We're sitting there across from each other. But it happens to be the day that you had a bunch of teeth extracted. <laughs> Calendar just happened that way. And your tongue is numb and your face feels swollen, you know, the whole Novocaine thing. You could order your favorite meal, but you're not going to be able to extract the flavor. You're not going to be able to taste the joy. And this is what Ecclesiastes is telling us. Stop obsessing on lining up 50 plates of food. Start asking God for the taste buds and the teeth to enjoy what's already in front of you. And by the way, it's how most people live in our society, especially in America. It's just more, more, more. <laughs> we can't even taste the food, but we'll just line up all the plates in front of us. Wouldn't it be more joyful to have just one plate of food, but it's on a normal day where you can chomp on it, you can savor it, and you can eat the meal. Wouldn't it be more joyful if you actually taste the good in the house that you already have? What if you really chewed on the flavor of the loved ones you already have? What if you really savored the health and the youth that you already have or have left? <laughs> the gifts that you already have. This is a profound, deep truth in this book of Ecclesiastes. And it lines up with one of my favorite verses, Psalm 38, where it says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Taste it, see it. He wants you to use your five senses to experience him and use your soul to connect every good thing in your life to him. What is a person who can actually taste and see that the Lord is good? What's their life habit? They're a person who takes refuge in God. They run to God. They're filtering everything in their life through God. The good is from God. The bad, well, God, I know that's not from you, but you're going to get me through this. You're going to work it for good. Oh, the joys. We're talking about the enjoyment of life, the joys of those who take refuge in God. Verse 19, repeating this from a different translation, just to give you a slightly different look at it. Furthermore, this middle-class guy who represents a lot of people on earth to whom God has given riches and wealth. Believe me, our middle-class life is that. You might not think it is, but it is. And God gives him the ability to enjoy them. This is a gift from God. So question, what if instead of seeking the next thing you want, 
And if you're like me, you've got a list. I literally have on my little cloud document where I keep all my thoughts, dream garage thoughts. There may be about 12 cars in that garage, right? There's always a next thing. And Ecclesiastes would say, as long as you're seeking, you know, loving God, fearing God, and there's nothing wrong with the next thing. But don't expect the next thing's going to give you a, a lasting joy if you're not finding joy in what you already have. So what if, instead of always obsessing on the next thing, pray for it, work for it, that's fine. But what if you put just as much energy into asking God, God, would you give me the ability to enjoy what I already have? Would you create in me the habit of receiving every good thing in my life as a gift from your hand? Becomes a way, then you're worshiping God throughout the day. Not necessarily in Christianese or even in song, but just every good moment. I know for me as I've studied this, this is something I need to grow in. Now let's compare these two guys. We looked at middle class guy on the left. Solomon's now going to write about a guy who has way more wealth. And not just more wealth, but in that culture, more honor, more kids, which was a big thing in that time. In fact, he's going to say this guy has everything his heart desires. He's got the 12 cars, and then he buys 12 more. He's like a Tony Stark. Solomon's writing from experience. But this man, let's say he has eight houses, he's constantly stressed about the maintenance at all of them. He's looking at the weather. Oh, my goodness, there's a storm in Florida. How's my house in Florida? Oh, there's an earthquake in California. I'm worrying about my house there. He's got eight houses. But they don't bring him joy, they bring him worry. Meanwhile, the man with one house every night, he locks up and he stands in that driveway and he looks. He knows his hard work as a plumber, as an electrician. Just He's worked hard, there's that house. And he's like, thank you, God. You let me do what I love. You've given me a family and you've given me this great house. This is the contrast of these two. The, the middle class guy's like, this is just the perfect house for me. And he's, he has far more joy in his life, even though he has less circumstantial happiness. If we're honest, we wear ourselves out in different ways. As I said before, you could substitute house for the next relationship, more, more connection with people, the next promotion. We all have our thing. But the, the guy who's just enjoying what he already has is, is so much happier. Here's a little bit of that in Ecclesiastes 6, verse 2. God gives some people wealth and possessions and honor so that they lack nothing their hearts desire. This is next level. This guy's a billionaire. This guy's the guy on the right. But God does not grant them the ability to enjoy it. They've got the 50 plates of food. They don't have taste buds. They don't have teeth. And you can actually see this, uh, you'll see this in the world if you get around. Their, their kids and their kids' friends will enjoy it. While they worked so hard for it, and they're just obsessed with the fear of losing it. And Solomon says, man, if you live your life that way, what a grievous way to live life. What a meaningless way to live life. <laughs> to actually uh, expend all your energy getting and getting and it's all sitting in front of you but you can't take a bite out of it there's a hebrew word here this idea to enjoy what you have the hebrew word is shalat and it means it can be translated given the capacity to extract the enjoyment from a gift so do you want the one plate of food with the gift of shallot? You can eat it. Or do you want the 50 plates of food without shallot? It's a no-brainer once we understand the paradigm. God gives this other guy, he allows him to work and get all his stuff. But here's the difference. The other guy is not receiving everything in his life as from the hand of God. That's the difference between getting shallot or not. You get the joy to enjoy what you have by acknowledging, I receive this as from the hand of God. But you close that valve when the mentality is, 
it's all here because I worked so hard or my parents worked so hard or it's all at the human level. You, you close off that valve of enjoyment. I want to just pause and talk to you right now. What do you most desire right now? Just between you and God. In your life, what is it that you most, you've just been running after it this week or this month? I, I've got a list. I'm guessing you do too. More money, more security, more laughter, more love, more health, more affection, more family. Here's the profound eye-opener today. God can give you the ability to enjoy what you already have more than you would enjoy getting that thing you desire. Does that make sense? I didn't write it out very well on the slide. The thing that you think will make you happy, there's actually more happiness dormant and waiting for you, more enjoyment in what God has already put on your plate. The other guy, the wealthy guy, he perceives more problems. And in every season, even the best of seasons, his eyes are fixed on what's wrong with each property or the stress of it. And then he's got all these greedy and selfish relatives who just want to take his stuff. And he's constantly thinking, I'll be happy when... Versus the first guy who has less and is thinking, I have everything I need now from my father. I receive it as a good gift. Why the difference? Why does God give the one the ability to enjoy what he has and he doesn't for the other? It's this idea of acknowledging every good thing in my life is from the hand of God. I've skipped ahead and I've taught you this, but let's review it. Receive every good thing in your life as a gift from the hand of God. Now, I, I'm not going to point to myself as an example of how to do this, but we do have a good example of how to do this in the New Testament, and I'm going to cruise through it in just a moment. One of my favorite pastors, his name is Daryl Del Husay. He's in Arizona. I heard him teach on Ecclesiastes years ago. If you hear anything profound in this message or this series, it's either from him or from Richard or from Solomon, okay? Daryl tells this example of a suitcase or a bag. He says, God packs your bag of your life and he puts into your bag your health, your IQ, your relationships, your talents, your abilities. He packs your bag a certain way. And Daryl says, the reason most of us lose our joy is we have a nose problem. We always are sticking our nose in other people's bags. And we want what they have. And they go, well, if I had their talents, or if I had that house, or if, if I had his wife, or, you know, if my kids were like that, then, then I'd really be happy. Meanwhile, in your bag, you have everything necessary for life and for godliness. Everything you need to not only get to heaven and have a whole bunch of great results there of eternal reward and glory to God, but to enjoy your life, and to laugh, and to taste. This verb in Ecclesiastes 6 about the wealthy man who doesn't get to enjoy what he have, has literally means he can't see it. He can't taste. He can't see because he doesn't believe that the Lord is good. He's not looking to God. He's just looking to his stuff. Where you fix your gaze is a habit. Your gaze, what you, you know, lock your eyes on. And if your eyes are always locked on what's wrong with your life or what was better in the past or what maybe will be better in the future, you can totally miss out on any joy today. And it's a gift that God wants to give you as a follower of Jesus. You have received it if you've received salvation, but join me in saying, God, I want to learn how to Chew it, taste it. You know who was really good at this was Paul the Apostle. In Philippians 4, you've heard this verse where Paul says, I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have lots of stuff. And I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation. You've heard us teach on this verse. It's a famous verse in the Bible. Did you know that Paul the Apostle before he became a follower of Jesus, he was a scholar of the Old Testament. And we know exactly the rabbi he studied under. The guy's name is Gamaliel. 
Gamaliel was like an Ivy League rabbi. It was like going to Yale or Stanford or Harvard or Princeton for a Jewish scholar to get to study with Gamaliel. Guess what Gamaliel's PhD was in, in our terms. Ecclesiastes. Paul knew the book of Ecclesiastes really well. And he essentially summarizes Ecclesiastes in different ways through the New Testament. Look at 1 Timothy 4. He says to young Timothy, a pastor who's, you know, pretty spiritual and seeking the kingdom of God. Timothy, don't forget, food is good. Wine is good. Everything created by God is good. And it shouldn't be rejected. You should receive the gifts that you can receive with your body on earth. Receive them with gratitude. It's the same theme. 1 Timothy 6, 17, Paul writes, Instruct those who are rich here in this present world. That's a lot of us Americans. Don't put your hope in your riches because they'll either leave you or at your funeral, you'll leave them. You have less than 100 years with your riches, but you have an eternity to live. So put your hope in God who richly supplies us with all things to what? Enjoy. All things to enjoy. God wants you to enjoy what he gives to you. God wants you to enjoy hugs and laughter and love scratching your puppy on the belly and whatever else you enjoy, taking drives, taking walks. But as you study Paul's synthesis of the book of Ecclesiastes, you realize this is something that was learned. This is a learned skill. It's not our natural. Even after we receive salvation, we've received the gift. We have to learn how to enjoy the gift by daily correcting our eyesight. Wow, God, I really got obsessed on what those people have or in my case as a pastor, sometimes what that church is doing, get me back here enjoying just what you've given me is so incredible. The family you've given me, the health you've given me. Lord, get my eyes back in my bag instead of in everyone else's. It requires effort. Savoring the joy in your daily life as it is, is a skill, but it's one that you can learn. So let's think back to the apple. The apple. I want you to imagine that every day there's a conveyor belt and every day one apple zooms by you. Some days, nice little red apple. Some days it's a big green apple. Some days it's an apple with a worm inside. Some days it's a bruised apple, let's be honest. Some days it's a rotten apple. The interesting thing is you can never enjoy yesterday's apple today. You can never enjoy tomorrow's apple today. But God, he actually wants you every day. When it's a decent apple, take the biggest bite you can take. Let the juices run down the front of your face. The joy of the Lord is our strength. Let's live for heaven, but let's actually show the people around us what heaven can look like on earth. Release tomorrow, forget the past. Enjoy what God has given you now as a gift from him. Every good and perfect gift is from above, from your Father in heaven. (laughs) Here's that conveyor belt, all those different ones. I don't know what kind of apple is in your life today. Paul, the same guy who synthesized Ecclesiastes, He says in 1 Thessalonians about joy, rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again, rejoice. God commands us to praise him, which is to say, Lord, I want to thank you for every good thing in my life. Why does God command us to praise him so much? Is he needy? Is he insecure? Not at all. He actually has millions of angels, all these different species of angels. Each one's as unique as humans, I believe. They are constantly praising him day and night. He's not short on praise. You know why God commands you to praise him? It's for your good. Because it lifts your eyes out of your neighbor's suitcase. Get your mind out of the past and the way you wish you could redo it or go back to it. Get your eyes off of the people who are letting you down and it lifts your gaze up to him. And that's what unlocks shalat the ability to enjoy what you have. God says, if you will live as a worshiper of me, here's the irony, you'll enjoy what you already have a lot more than the millionaires and the billionaires enjoy what they have. So believers, 
Let's choose to live this week. Would you just join me? You know, these next six or seven days from now till we get together again, every cup of coffee, every sunrise, every flower, every hug, every good moment, we're not gonna get them all, but let's make it our goal to just be like, God, I wanna receive every good thing in my life here and now as from your hand. Let's just make this our prayer. God, would you help me taste and see that you're good? Would you help me experience the joy of those who take refuge in you? Let me pray that for you here. Father, I thank you that you've given us both parts of the gift. You have given us salvation through your sacrifice on the cross. You've given us eternal life. You've given us relationship with you, freedom from sin, freedom from shame. And Lord, you also tell us that in Christ, we have everything necessary for life and for godliness. You've given us a supernatural ability to enjoy life way beyond what our circumstances would suggest. Lord, I just pray over every single one of us, including myself, would you help us these next six or seven days, these next four or five weeks, help us learn to unlock your shalat. <laughs> Help us learn to unlock your ability to enjoy what we already have by fixing our eyes on you. And just every good thing is like a ricochet. Every good moment, every pleasure, it ricochets and it bounces our eyes up to you. And we say, God, I thank you. I thank you for your word. I thank you for a church where I can gather. I thank you for worship. I thank you for a car that runs. I thank you for a house with a roof that doesn't leak. I thank you for air conditioning. And, and we receive all these things as a gift from you. May we be such a joyful people with the joy of the Lord that our friends, our neighbors, our relatives would say, what is it about you? And we say, well, you just gotta come to church with me and learn about Jesus. We love you, Lord. We pray it in your name, amen.